introduce someone you all probably already know, Assembly Member Todd Gloria. Hello, Todd. Hi. Hello, Kim. Thanks for this opportunity. Oh, this is such a pleasure and really an honor. So we're going to be talking today a little bit about you, but within the context and the framework of a play that uh, we are actually streaming. We're offering tickets to view via stream. And it's called JQA, and it's all about what it means to be American. And it's about government. It's about democracy. It's about um, all the sort of values and principles that we hope guide our leaders. And, um, and so we want to use that framework to get to know you a little bit more. And I do want to just say a little housekeeping. Please remember to uh, turn off your, your cameras and also to mute yourself. And if you have any questions for Todd, we'll be taking them uh, towards the end of the hour and you, you can just drop them in the chat and I will share them. All right, so here we go. So the play, um, and indulge me for a moment, Todd. So the play is called JQA and that stands for John Quincy Adams. And it was written by Aaron Posner. And the first scene features a young John Quincy Adams, a young JQA, nine years old, being interrogated by his father, uh, John Adams, about what, his, what he believes to be the definition of government. And he says, he asks his nine-year-old boy, what is government? And the young JQA at first is a little bewildered by this uh, question, as I think um, I think anyone would be really, especially a child. Um, so he says a couple of things, and John Adams is, you know, mildly impressed, but then says, actually, government is defined as self-management. It is control. It is restraint. It is the careful marshalling of resources. Individuals require government, just as cities and countries require government. Good government makes everything better. Good government makes everything positive in our lives possible. So that's the quote. So Todd, what do you think of this definition? Do you agree with it? Uh, why or why not? Um, well, first off, Kim, thanks for this opportunity and thanks to the rep for this situation. I just, how fun, what a great opportunity. I'm so grateful to be able to share kind of a candidate form in a way that's a little more accessible, right? And I think is a little more revealing of, of an individual potential leader uh, sort of thought on stuff. And so this question at the gate is perfect. Um, I do like the definition. I do agree with Adams. And I think it's almost revolutionary these days to say that, right? I mean, I feel like Government is everyone's favorite punching bag, um, but as someone who has spent their entire professional career in the public sector and someone who is constantly criticized, at least by some and definitely my opponent in the mayor's race for having done that, I don't think it's a bad thing. And in fact, the way I would phrase it is that I have spent the last 20 plus years of my life getting up with the sole purpose of making my hometown a better place to live. Uh, and I've chosen to do that through the vehicle of government. And um, I do, I mean, I think about all the things in our lives that are better. And the challenge that we have in government, in my opinion, is that when we do our jobs well, it is often unnoticed, right? If your garbage mm. got picked up today, all you had to do is sit out in front of your house and when you came home, it was the gone. Uh, the water came on when you turned the tap, the toilet flushed when you flushed it. I mean, <laughs> these are all the actions of government. And it isn't to say that we're perfect. We certainly make mistakes. Um, but I have never in my years in public service ever gotten a letter said, hey, thanks for the water uh, flowing through my tap, or thanks for picking up the garbage, or thanks for picking up the 911 call. Quite to the contrary, you know, that pothole in front of my house has been there for a week. What are you going to do about it? That graffiti has right. been there forever. And it's not that those are not valid concerns. It's just an observation. That the bad stuff's easier to believe. And so what Adam says in terms of good government making everything better feels almost revolutionary to say, particularly in this political environment, but I so identify with that. And what about in the context of San Diego? Do you feel that there's anything specific to San Diego that calls for a particular kind of government? A particular kind of? Well, I wouldn't uh, advocate for a unique or different form of government in San Diego. I mean, I, I'm glad that we're part of California. I'm glad we're part of the United States. 
Um, but the notion of good government in San Diego, um, I think has to be pointed out because um, it's often, again, overlooked. And I will tell you that it's the you know city employee who goes to work every day for a whole career and they do it without the expectation of ever becoming rich, right? <laughs> they do it simply for the purpose of serving their community. And we are the beneficiaries of their work and we probably don't think about it. We probably don't even see it, um, but we are the ben beneficiaries of it. And I think if I can give you a really contemporary example, because again, when the good stuff happens, it's often overlooked. But at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were telling everyone to stay home to, to protect themselves and their health, it was evident to everyone, particularly people in jobs like mine, um, that that was a difficult thing to say to people who don't have homes. You know, stay home to those who don't have homes. And what we did, Kim, I think is something that is increasingly taken for granted or overlooked. We immediately got my Sen Senator Tony Atkins and I were able to get about $7 million out of the state send that to the city. We took our convention center, which is used to hosting Comic-Con and auto shows and medical device uh, shows and repurposed it into our region's largest temporary homeless shelter. And that site with state funding, it's a city owned building with city workers, people who might've been running a library before are now running a shelter. And they're partnered up with county workers and nonprofit workers. And what we've done Kim over the last seven months is to not have a massive spread of COVID-19 amongst our, unhabited, our, our, our unsheltered population. And so again, we may have missed that pothole uh, on the street in front of your house, but we have successfully housed thousands of people during the pandemic. And as a result, we have not had an outbreak amongst our homeless population when we all thought that was inevitable at the beginning of this. That's what good government can do. And that's happening right now as we speak in this city. Thank you. All right. So in the next scene of the play, President George Washington recruits the now adult JQA to be the minister of the Netherlands. And he challenges the young JQA with a call to service and with the chance to make a difference and to serve the needs of his country. So what motivated you to join and begin a career in politics and public service? Um, <laughs> well, I have to confess that I was that nerdy kid that would watch the news, would watch C-SPAN voluntarily. I just, I always had a fascination in it for public service, for government, for politics in a way that my brother was interested in sports, you know, I was interested in political conventions, et cetera. And so there was that part of it. But the true answer to your question, and I didn't realize it at the time, but when I was growing up, my mom was a maid, my dad was a gardener. Um, and as you might imagine with those professions, uh, it was often difficult to make ends meet in San Diego, a, a city as expensive as we are, even back then it was expensive. Um, <laughs> so there would be periods of time where we didn't have a car. Uh, we just, we, we didn't have the money to have one. And so therefore we did it. And on occasion we'd have to borrow people's cars. And obviously this was an economic necessity. And what was always bizarre to me, Kim, was that when we were done borrowing the car, my brother and I were usually tasked with washing it afterward. Uh, and then we would take and fill it up with gas and then return it. And I remember asking very distinctly, my mother, like, we don't have any money. Like, why are we paying for water and uh, soap and, and sponges and all this stuff and then gas, which, you know, was probably 90 cents back then, but still was expensive. Um, <laughs> and the answer was, you're supposed to leave things better than you found it. You're supposed to return mm -hmm. things better than you were given them. And my parents just said very exp ex explicitly, if you care about something, you leave it better than you found it. Mm -hmm. Well, my parents are not political people. I actually registered them to vote years later when I was doing a voter registration campaign. But unbeknownst to them, that was really a recipe for a career in public service. Uh, you know, I love my hometown and I've chosen to spend my time doing what I can to make it better uh, than I found it. Um, and so my parents' very um, humble backgrounds and their teachings to their two kids really is what set me up for this uh, career in public service. Wow. What do you tell people? I'm going a little off script for a moment, but if you were to meet, for instance, I, I mentioned earlier to you when we were off camera that my, my daughter's actually helping you out because she too is someone who, who wants to make the world a better place. Um, what, what do you, what, what kind of advice do you give kids like that? Um, well, they can. Um, you know, I think that particularly at times, it seems so overwhelming. I think for all of the young kids who had their schools, schooling interrupted, whatever else, um, they have to hear from us that change is possible to give them that sense of hope, right? 
Um, and I've witnessed it. I mean, I've witnessed it in my own lifetime, right? If you would have told me when I was born uh, that I would have the freedom to marry, I would have thought that that was possible, but it's happened in my time. You know, we are potentially likely uh, to elect our first female vice president who happens to be a biracial woman. Um, you know, this country, even though it doesn't feel like it on a lot of days, it really will allow you to do anything. And so, um, you know, for young people like your daughter, you know, I hope that they can feel that hope, that you know, that optimism that they're born with, that that people like me can can mirror that and can encourage that and fan that flame. And I think honestly, I am the the biggest believer in the world of mentoring, uh, because mm. my parents they raised me with the best morals and values. But as I mentioned, they are not political people. They didn't understand the importance of voting and what have you. And so I benefited from meeting people on the way who saw something in me that maybe I didn't even see and invested in me. And that specifically was Congresswoman Susan Davis, who I met when I was 14 years old through a youth mentoring program called the Aaron Price Fellows Program. And mm -hmm. man, did I not know that that hall pass from my guidance counselor telling me to apply for this program. I had no idea how that was going to change my life. But you know, what my parents didn't have in terms of political uh, understanding, Susan did. And so my advice would be the number one, that there is hope and that you can do this. But number two, seek out the helpers, right? Find, find the mentors that will be, I've never found anyone who didn't want to impart uh, advice and information and, and whatnot. And um, often it, it's a position of courage to have to ask for that kind of help. Right. But people are so willing to do that. And I have been the absolute beneficiary of people who are willing to take the time to teach me what I did not know. Um, and I'm so much better for it. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, um, she's having a great time. She's learning a lot. So Good. thank you. Um, okay, back to the play. So moving on in the play, there's the next scene called Do It, Compromise. And it envisions a late night debate and a lot of whiskey between JQA and Henry Clay, who was referred to as the great compromiser in his day because of his role in several important legislative compromises. Some say that the spirit of compromise has completely broken down in our current politics. So Todd, do you believe in bipartisan compromise? What can be done to foster more bipartisanship in our current climate? I do, um, although I acknowledge and, and respect the fact that that hasn't necessarily been on display as much in recent years, um, but that isn't a reason to, to say it's dead. You know, it's actually a reason to endeavor harder to try and use those examples and make it happen. Um, you know, how do we do more of that? You know, from, from my experience, <clears throat> and I've, I've served in two elected offices or two elected bodies, right? The San Diego City Council and the California State Legislature. And I'll tell you, there's two things that I thought they're unfortunately not both both bodies don't have both of these characteristics um, but the city council is small right it's nine people and as a consequence you really get to know your colleagues you know their spouses you know their likes and dislikes their habits right it's easy to do a character analysis for the other eight people and really to understand them as human beings and the on, in the legislature and this is not always a politic thing to say um but the legislature um, is not subject to um, the kinds of quorum restrictions that we have um, at the local level, which is to say um, that when we get together a large group of us, it isn't necessarily a public meeting. And so you can in dialogue in a very authentic way. And that sometimes seems unseemly, I think to members of the public, but the truth is, is those conversations in the members lounge and you know at dinner parties and whatever are where you get to know each other. So even though that's a larger body, it's, you know, assembly plus Senate's 120 people. It's a little harder to get to know everyone's little, you know, uh, idiosyncrasies. Um, but it does allow for a more level of authenticity that you can't necessarily get the local level when when more than a couple of you meet together becomes a public meeting and therefore uh, it has to be noticed and all that kind of stuff. So the smallness of the city council and the intimacy, despite the size of the legislature, facilitates seeing each other as people. And I recognize that in our politics today, it's been commoditized and you know it feels like entertainment uh, in a way. Um, understanding why someone believes a particular way, knowing that my Republican colleague may care a great deal about COVID because he had it, right? Or um, I have a, a Democratic colleague who may not uh, be as supportive of something that my, our caucus might believe in because of a personal experience. You know, when you take out the politics, you understand the person as a person, um, it becomes, easier to do that. 
And the last thing that I think has nothing to do with the atmospherics, it's just about the individuals, is whether or not you see anything less than 100% being a victory. And I will say that there are some in this, in this line of work that believe have sort of an all or nothing approach to it. And that is fatally flawed in a democracy. I have never gotten anything 100%, right? Um, <laughs> and the way I phrase it to people is that if I can get 70% of what I was trying to get, um, I'll, I'll take that deal. And then I'll come back tomorrow to try and get the remaining 30%. But if you have, if you only have a group of people or a majority of people who see 100% or nothing as being um, the objective, then nothing really happens. And so it is incumbent upon the voters to really look for those people who understand that in a democracy, progress is incremental uh, and that you know 70% of a deal is, is a good deal and take it um, with, and it's not about compromising your values. It's a commitment to come back and do more, but the recognition, and it's probably how I grew up. You know, if, if people said that that, uh, nutrition assistance program had to service literally everybody that was available, or we could make sure that it impacts income qualified people. If you went nothing, you know, like all or nothing, then no one would have gotten anything and families like mine would have been hungry. Right. And so I recognize that often I'm sitting there on behalf of people who need me to get to a deal. And it often breaks my heart when I know when we couldn't get perfect but I know this job is very much about doing the most amount of good for the most number of people. If you can say that it clears that test, then you should take that deal again with the commitment to wake up the next morning and figure out how you can get the rest of it the next time. It kind of reminds me of a saying, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, which right. makes a lot of sense to me. You actually mentioned a couple of things that really resonate with me. First is this idea about authenticity and getting to know each other at an authentic level. And the second is that for those of us who are, you know, watching politicians from our homes, on TV, on our screens, that yes, that, that politics have become somewhat, as you say, commodified, right? It is somewhat more, uh, it has entertainment value now. How, how would you propose we get back to that authenticity, that, that sort of human connection that we need in order to see each other as human beings? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it starts with understanding that elected officials are human too, you know, and it's- You're not invincible? <laughs> or from, let me tell you something. I'm not going to pan this camera that way because you're going to see my hamper full of laundry that I got to get done. <laughs> uh, we, we are human. And I think that's actually important because sometimes when people are surprised by the frailties of politicians, you know, I'm confused by that because we don't have- uh, a monarchy, right? We're not God's personification on earth. We're yes. just from our community and we're asked, we're, we asked to serve and we're granted that opportunity, but we're just like you. I mean, I still got to put gas in my car. You know, I'm often asked, do you, pay? you have no idea what gas, oh, I know. I, pay, I, I, I fill up at the pump too. Um, so I think a part of it starts with understanding that uh, we're human beings too. And I think when you allow that, um, that it comes less about whatever gotcha thing that's had. And then you could actually talk about people in a real way and really um, discuss things in an authentic way. The other part is, you know, sometimes people talk about, well, you know, the meals that we have as, as colleagues, right? And I think the public has some notion of like <laughs> smoke filled rooms and wood paneled and mahogany, you know, whatever. And Kim, I have to tell you, I remember one of my dearest friends in the legislature, the first, we were baby assembly members. We had just been elected and I asked her, hey, do you want to go grab a meal? And she's like, sure. And then she was shocked when I took her to a mall food court. <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> honey, I don't know what they're paying you, but I'm not going anywhere fancy. And she appreciated the authenticity. And Kim, what I'll tell you about that is that it was over that meal that some would think of as like, oh, these are two politicians, like, you know, uh, coming up with some backroom deal. No, we talked about our families. We talked mm -hmm. about where we came from. We talked about why we do this. And why that was important is that we started building the authenticity and the trust that, that when policy comes later and when there's a piece of legislation, say for equality, that can be thorny, right? It can be tough. You, it's a tough vote. And you think that there's gonna be people who are yell at you. To be able to look at me and remember that meal and know who I am and where I'm coming from, it creates trust that allows things to get done. So. Again, I think it starts with seeing us as as actual human beings who are who have you know idiosyncrasies and and frailties and and you know um, what have you, um, and then allowing us to you know acknowledging well you do have to eat with your coworker right you you should go out and have a meal and have a conversation and and if you're having a meal with your coworker the way I would have one 
what's what's going to happen? You're you're just going to talk about your kids and and your house and the errands and what you did over the weekend. And again, it's through that relationship building that big policy gets done. I did a couple of tough bills this past year, particularly because of COVID, where we couldn't com- have conversations in person. Yeah. It was really trading off of those relationships. So the fact that they believe me to be a decent human being and they know that I'm here with the right motivations. And uh, I don't know if I like this, but I'm willing to allow this to continue. And ultimately what we got was something that's really good for San Diego, but it comes off of the authentic relationships that have been built over years. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree. I feel like you cannot replace or you cannot put a, a value on that human connection and especially over food. I'm a foodie. Yes. Um, that's the Phil- Filipino side of me. <laughs> a lumpia can sell yeah, any I was so <laughs> going to say lumpia, man. We got to have lumpia. Um, yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. Um, but I think that so many, um, you know, as you said, it's that that sort of sharing of authentic, authentic selves over a meal is just so valuable. And I think, you know what, if I may, the other place that that happens is in the arts. It's that exchange of ideas and authenticity that happens in the theater when we're sitting and we're watching a performance. Um, you know, I gotta, I gotta plug my, my industry here. Um, Makes sense. You're, there's a trust <laughs> there too, right? Like, you're, you're not gonna be able to keep it, you know, you're this direction, I'm slow, that's gonna translate, right? There's, there's trust that you have to build with one of them. Absolutely, absolutely. And connection. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go back to the play. So later in the play, JQA is speaking with Andrew Jackson and says this about leadership. Leadership is leading forwards, not backwards. To keep improving, to make the country better for everyone, not just the people you like or who got you elected. Government exists to lead us all forward. What is your definition, Todd, of leadership? And what is your vision for leading forward right now? Yeah. I like that. Um, and it kind of needs to be said explicitly today, right? And uh, you know, Joe Biden is running particularly on that sort of language, right? I'm running as a Democratic nominee, but I will be an American president. It seems extraordinary to have to say it, but I think we all understand why that's happening, right? And um, and I and I very much identify with that. You know, I um, as you heard with the last answer, you know, I come to the table uh, with the policy and the platform and the experience that I've, I've had. But ultimately, you're governing on behalf of everybody, right? And you can't lose sight of that. So, you know, leadership, in in, in its best, is defining a vision, in 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 bringing people with you to accomplish it, right? I mean, in in, in my mind, that's at its best. Um, I think another version of leadership is often telling people what they don't want to hear because they need to hear it, right? Um, you know, I've, particularly when I was on this, when I first got elected to the city council was back in 2008. Uh, the Great Recession had hit. Um, I had been elected after knocking on 25,000 doors to get my, my to be elected to the city council. And Kim, I can tell you, over all those thousands of conversations, no one said they wanted less of anything, right? Less road repair, less library right. hours, less firefighters. They had it. And then here, I'm elected at a time when the city was facing a massive budget mm-hmm. deficit, like over 180 million dollars, and we were necessarily going to be doing less for people. And so what I would often tell people is that, you know, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what I think you need to know. And in many ways, I also think that that's leadership, right? Again, it's, it's most aspirational is, you know, we, before the end of this decade, we will land a man on the moon and bring him back safely to, safely to earth. You know, you know, you have nothing to fear, but for yourself, it's aspirational stuff. But sometimes it's simply about saying, hey, listen, this is going to be rough. And my commitment to you is to be open and transparent but we're going to figure this out. We're going to figure it out together. And we'll do, we'll get through this as quickly as possible. And that gets to the second part of your question. You know, I'm running for mayor in a time of a public health pandemic, the likes of which we haven't seen in a hundred years, mm-hmm. you know, a uh, economic recession, the likes of which we haven't seen in nearly a hundred years, um, racial strife that we haven't seen in uh, 60 plus years. Right, a climate crisis, a homelessness crisis, an affordable housing crisis. I mean, there are so many challenges at once. And we're doing this because of the economy at a time with less resources than ever. Now, I feel particularly well suited to handle this because of what I just shared with you. You know, I've seen this before, right? right. Um, but I think that what San Diego and I think, frankly, our nation needs right now are people uh, who we understand um, have the best of intentions the right heart, the right values, the right priorities, uh, and a willingness to be open and transparent with the public and say, okay, listen, 
next mayor's probably going to add cut 200 million or plus out of the city's budget. It's not going to be pleasant, but we're going to do it in a way that minimizes impacts to neighborhoods that does it through a lens of equity, recognizing that the unemployment rate in certain neighborhoods in the city are, I think, triple what they are in other parts. And as a consequence, if we look at recovery, we have to think about that, um, that we can't lose sight of racial justice. I recognize that the concern that we have for our individual health and the health of our families and our finances and the finances of our loved ones may be so all consuming, it could squeeze out these really important conversations about race and structural racism, but we can't, we won't lose sight of that. Um, really, it's a commitment to multitask, right? And I'm often asked, well, how can you do this? I'm like, well, I think this is what everyone does in their own lives, right? I mean, <laughs> you have a job, you have a spouse, you have children, um, you know, you have individual interests that you have to pursue. You must multitask in your life. I, you should expect nothing less from your elected leaders. And yes, the challenges are bigger, um, but with the right team, you can accomplish it. So, um, and, and then lastly, so that, that's, that's the uh, stuff you need to know part. The aspirational vision for, that I have for our city is uh, a number of things, but it's kind of in the bucket of saying that we're going to stop acting like the small town that we're not and embrace <laughs> the big city that we are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that anyone who's been here for a period of time knows exactly what I'm talking about. We're mm -hmm. the eighth largest city in the country, the second largest in California, but it doesn't always feel like we act that way. And my hope is that we can get through these difficult times, get, you know, defeat COVID-19, get our economy back on track, make meaningful progress on racial justice and the like. But, you know, the aspirational goals would be to end chronic homelessness in our city. You know, there are cities that have done that, Kim. We're not one of them, but we yeah. could uh, to build a world-class transportation system. And I see that as necessary, not just because it'll put thousands of San Diegans to work at a time when we have high unemployment, and those happen to be jobs that pay good wages and allow families to live in a city like San Diego, but the end product would be something that would last us over a century, right? And it would be critical for our economic development, for meeting our climate action plan goals, and for uh, uh, preserving our quality of life. So I think that's a good thing to do. And probably most importantly of anything is to build more housing that is a affordable to working and middle-class people. You work in the arts, no one's necessarily getting rich unless you're a <laughs> Beyonce uh, in the arts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, most folks are following their passion. Like what I'm doing, I'm following my passion and you just wanna you know, have a, a secure life, right? And I think for probably most of your colleagues, they struggle to pay the rent and they can't foresee ever being able to buy a home. And I just happen to think that we can't be a great city if we're not a city that has a vibrant working and middle class. And that's gonna involve having housing that's actually priced for those folks. Because stop me if you heard this, but you probably experienced you know, seeing what is getting built and, say, and then calling and finding out what the rent is and realizing you can't afford to live there, you don't make enough. But then when you look at the programs that are offered for help, you probably make too much to qualify for any Right. Of and my, so my focus is on that middle section and trying to do what I can to fill in that gap in order to give people, frankly, the experience that I had. I'm the son of a maiden a gardener who were able to buy a home in San Diego. That story was possible 30 years ago. I think we all acknowledge that story is nearly impossible today. And you should have a mayor who's really focused on making sure that that is not accepted and that we'll do everything we can to fight back against that and give people who are willing to work hard a fighting chance to live in this city. That's the big vision. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to something you said about your vision or your idea of leadership and, and your thoughts on it. Um, a version of leadership that I have heard is that it is also someone who is willing to listen to ideas and, and maybe not just listen, but actually consider ideas that are, you know, they either don't agree with or, or that don't mesh with their own beliefs. How do you deal with that when, you know, and, and I imagine, you know, you, you, you strike me as the kind of person who is very open to listening to multiple perspectives. Um, what do you feel is your role as a leader when those ideas come to you? Yeah, you know what, I love that you asked that question because um, it's something that goes back to Susan Davis and what she taught me. And those of you that know Susan, uh, who is honestly one of the best in this business, I've known her a long time, <laughs> more than either of us would probably care to admit in a <laughs> uh, number of years. She's the exact same person that she was. That I, when I, the woman that I met when I was 14 years old is still the same person. Here we are 30 years later, having served you know, multiple terms in the legislature and, and 20 years in Congress. And it really speaks to her character. And some of you may know that her original profession was social work. Mm. And I love sharing that because I think 
young people often look at what I do and assume that I'm an attorney, right? <laughs> and I get it. I told them I'm a lawmaker, right? And of course you'd be an attorney, right? If you're gonna be right. a lawmaker, you should be an attorney. But social work was Susan's chosen profession. I actually worked for the County of San Diego for six years. So uh, I'm not a social worker, but I have worked in that setting. This work is so much more like social work than people realize because I spend mm -hmm. a lot of my day hearing from people who are having problems. I mentioned a moment ago, the problem could be as simple as a pothole in front of your house, but it could also be, I'm homeless and I, I don't wanna live on the streets. So how can you help me? Or you know, my, my neighborhood isn't safe and we need to form a neighborhood watch. I mean, it is a matter of, as you said, Kim, listening, right? And that was what Susan taught me. She said, and I'm not doing a good job of this tonight. If you do this job correctly, you should be listening more than you're talking. And that's a bit revolutionary from a leadership perspective to your original question, right. um, because I think people think of folks who are politicians and you're thinking of, you know, podiums and big microphones and pounding the desk and arguing. And, you know, if you if you're not talking, it's because you're not listening to the other person. You're waiting to retort with your own argument. back. Right? <laughs> yeah. And so I felt so fortunate to have had that advice from Susan. And I do my best to to honor and remember that. And and it gets to what you're saying. It, it, sometimes it means you listen to stuff that you don't like or that you don't agree with, or maybe it's flat out wrong. But my orientation to this job, as a member of the legislature, I have half a million constituents. And the way I think of it is I have half a million bosses. And wow. that involves a lot of listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, and it can be hard, right? You can get some stuff that is really hard to take. Some of it can be hateful. Some of it can be awful. But what I've always been struck by is that often in there, there's something that's really powerful and important. And my job, you know, most other states wouldn't call me an assembly member, they'd call me a representative. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important to remember because I'm a representative of half a million San Diegans when I go to the Capitol. And I need to listen to as many of those voices as possible to understand and properly represent them. So back to Susan's point, because again, she's so darn smart and so darn good at public service. It is about listening more than you talk. Yes, listening. Okay. So going back to the play, uh, there are three quotations in the play that all connect to each other. And early in the play, JQA's mother, Abigail Adams, says to him, to be good and to do good is the whole duty of man. And in another conversation, Frederick Douglass pleads with JQA to do more, Mr. Adams, please do more. And then later, JQA talks to a young Senator, Abraham Lincoln, and do good, and do right. So how do you, Todd, in your work as a political leader, plan to do good, do more, and do right by the people, by and for the people that you serve? I think that's a great culminating question in a way because we've sort of been talking about this, right? I mean, right. back to the do more, I mean, you heard me before, right? You get as much as you can as you're trying to work out a compromise and then you commit to come back the next day and do more, right? There's a great example of that in actually this year's uh, ballot measures. Um, one of the measures that'll be on your ballot if you live in the city of San Diego is measure B. Measure B is uh, a reform to the city's police review board to make it more independent and give them more responsibilities. I think it aligns in, with this time where we find people asking for more accountability from law enforcement. But if you go back in time to 2016, um, what myself and one of my colleagues tried to do that back then, but we didn't have the votes to do it. And I was not willing to just give up. And instead we came up with a compromise measure, put it on the ballot. Over 80% of San Diego voters approved that 2016 measure. And I was criticized at the time because people felt that it didn't go far enough. And I didn't disagree with them. But the fact of the matter is, is there wasn't the votes to do what we needed to get done. And there were still people that needed the reforms that we passed back then. And to those folks who were critical back in 2016, here we are in 2020, and Millie, it's four years later and four years is a long time, but we didn't give up. We continued to persist. And here we are with Measure B on the ballot, which I've endorsed, I've campaigned for, I've contributed to, uh, because we don't give up. So that's the do more, right? It's you do as much as you can, push the bar as far as you possibly can with the time that you have, but don't forget that ball. Don't call it mission accomplished. Come back and keep pushing. And it may take years and advocates are right to hold people like me accountable to say, okay, hey, you said that this was what you're doing for now. What's your next step? Well, here's the next step, right? Um, so that's an example of doing more. Um, doing right, I mean, that again, it's kind of the same thing, right? Is that in, in that regard, I think doing right in 2016 was to do as much as we could. One of the things we did in the 2016 measure 
was to require our existing review board to consider all officer involved shootings and in custody deaths. And to the extent that those are real concerns, there's a newspaper series going on right now about in custody deaths at our county jail. You understand why putting that on the books back in 2016 was important. And it's probably a part of the reason why there is uh, coverage of these, of these in custody deaths today, right? That's, we're not where we need to be, but we took a step in the right direction and in, in measure B may take a step even further. That's about doing right by people. Um, and then, you know, plan to do good. Well, it's all I've ever done. I mean, it's all I've, <laughs> I, here's a funny story. If I can, I, yeah, I can, sure. we're in a theater group, right? This is about stories yes. in a way, right? Um, so uh, I'm broadcasting you from uh, Gloria World headquarters, which is a one bedroom apartment in Mission Hills. <laughs> and, uh, I'm air conditioned and I had to go to the, the bank the, uh, yesterday to get quarters for the laundry <laughs> that's downstairs. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm the only person in the legislature who is uh, known to rent as opposed to own their home. Mm -hmm. And about every couple of months, Kim, I'll get a call from a reporter like, is it true? <laughs> Almost as if it's a point of shame. And I always re remind them there's actually nothing shameful about being a renter. In fact, about half of Californians are. Um, but then I remind them that, you know, I'm a public servant. And I represent coastal San Diego County, which is some of the most expensive real estate in our, in our, in our state. And you all pay me a good wage. Please do not mis mistake me. I'm not complaining about what I get paid, but it is a representation of the fact that even those who are well paid struggle to be able to afford a home. And that would include me. What do I mean? Why am I going with all this? Well, Doing good <laughs> means doing the public good, right? Which for every time I've seen a politician suddenly get a better house and a nicer car, you start to wonder what's going on there, right? <laughs> and so I offer my, my living circumstances as, uh, as hopefully an indication of the fact that, you know, we're doing, I'm doing the hopefully good work, you know, and that when I have done things like push to increase the city's minimum wage, uh, push to provide every person who works within our city limits with, uh, paid sick days. Um, these were controversial things, but those paid sick days, I think, make a lot of sense in the context of a pandemic. Uh, when I was pushing the city's climate action plan to make us the first big city to run on 100% renewable energy, some people really criticized that, thought it was too uh, audacious. Well, in the context of these wildfires that we've seen this year, I think that was doing good. Um, when I've set lofty goals around homeless reduction, uh, we have not met any of those goals, Kim, and, I, and my heart aches for that. But I don't understand someone who would say to me that you should have a lower goal when it comes to having uh, people on the streets, right? I don't think there's an acceptable number in a city, in a state, in a country as wealthy as ours of people who are allowed to live on our streets, on our sidewalks, in our canyons, our alleyways. Um, so I, <laughs> I, uh, I will continue to do the best that I can, the most good. I do it without any expectation of becoming wealthy. And in fact, if I do, you probably should ask a question or two. Uh, you know, I, I wear my, my modesty with pride because my goal is not to be wealthy. My goal is not to enrich other people. My goal is to simply make my hometown a better place to live. So that's how you do good. That's how you do more and it's how you do right by people. Wonderful. So I'm going to open it up to questions um, from the audience. If you do have a question, uh, go ahead and drop it in the chat and I will share it. Um, but while we're waiting, Todd, I do want to offer you something. Um, so, you know, we, we're talking about this in the context of this play that San Diego Rep is doing, JQA. It is a story of a real person in history, and it's an exploration of all these ideals and all of these principles that we have been talking about really in your career, in your journey, and how you navigate with those uh, guiding principles. And so I think it's fairly clear that the power of storytelling is really indelible in this act of empathy and human connection. I keep going back to that because I feel like, you know, just to go back to something you said earlier, I feel like that is something that unfortunately is suffering right now because of COVID. Yeah. Um, but the arts have always seemed to find a way to connect and to, to engage in a really empathic way. In your vision of San Diego, where do arts and culture fit in? Critical. And if, if I can expand on that. Yeah. Um, a, 
a city has to be more than a collection of buildings, right? And it's the arts that give cities life, right? And I think that there are two things that, that nothing about this experience is pleasant or positive, right? All of us wish this never happened. Um, we grieve for those who are sick, those who have died. Um, but if maybe there's two things that are good for the arts in here, there's, these are two thoughts that I have. One is that the fact that we haven't been able to enjoy the arts for the last number of months, you know, certainly not from a performance art perspective, and many of our cultural institutions, museums have been closed. We yeah. can't have in-person performances, the list goes on and on. You know, when we think about how horrible this time is, I hope that people recognize that a part of what has made it so difficult is the fact that the arts have been taken away from us. And while some may try to see that as, as what the arts are often uh, described as, as being like elective or like a dessert in life. Right, right. Um, I hope that they would see it as being central. And that the second that the public health order is removed and we go back to life as it was, you know, in March or something approximating what it was in, before, prior to March, that people race to the rep, they race to the globe or the playhouse, that they rush to Balboa Park to go, you know, into the institutions or, you know, visit, um, you know, uh, uh, the La Jolla and the Museum of Contemporary Art, you know, that they, that they would do that because they've been prohibited from seeing that and that they would understand that what, a part of what's made this time so hard is the absence of that. So I'm hopeful that this is maybe a clarifying clarion moment, right, for people when they understand their relation to the arts and how central it is to their well-being, to their happiness, and that, that maybe we don't think of that as an elective, but they think of that as central. The other thing that fits into this is, Kim, you may be familiar with something that we call the penny for the arts, which has mm -hmm. long been a blueprint for funding in, in, from the city when it comes to the arts. And uh, I'm gonna assume that at least a couple of people here may not be as familiar, but it's the idea of taking a penny out of every dollar of our tourist tax that's collected and giving it to arts and culture institutions in San Diego. As I mentioned earlier, I was chair of the budget committee for many years. During my time, we adopted a blueprint to try and get from the current fraction of that penny that we're currently at to get to the full penny. We've never been able to get there. And a part of the challenge for that is that that penny is all currently spoken for, but it's spoken for uh, by any number of other needed and essential services of the city, road repair, public safety, et cetera. Well, as you know, our hotels are limited or closed. Uh, the tourism tax has fallen horrifically. This is a huge driver in the city's current economic crisis it finds itself in. And so it's my observation that as we grow that dollar back, right, as, as uh, we get control of COVID and the convention center reopens and events resume and we throw the open the doors of the city and we welcome people back in, that as we build that, that tourism tax base back up again, we're not doing it from a, this is a dollar for the arts or this is a dollar for firefighters, right? And that often becomes a battle that the arts struggle to win. But instead we're starting from a new baseline. And if we do it with leaders that understand the inherent value of the arts, and build it back from the beginning so that we're not, it's not zero sum. We're not taking it from this thing to give it to the arts, right. but that we're saying each dollar comes in. Maybe, again, I'm not saying there's anything positive about COVID, but maybe this is a way for us to reach a goal that seemed impossible before because it was a zero sum game. And instead this is all additive, right? This is all growing it back. And then maybe this is how we actually do right by the arts and actually uh, fund this organization. And can I just say, this is gonna be so important because the arts are so impacted right now. I'm so fearful for the arts organization. I'm going to survive this. For those that do this money come purposeful invest because I don't know what people are going to come see. The, the web, uh, but after that, you know, you got to give them institutions and um, experiences that they want to have. And, and that's the art. Uh, just a couple observations of how important the arts are and how we could potentially then more appropriately going forward. Thank you for that. It was, that's really gratifying to hear. And I agree with you, of course, I'm biased because I, I am definitely uh, someone who is well steeped in the arts and culture sector. Um, but I too believe that it is essential, that it is, it is absolutely critical to humanity really. Um, you know, our, our work as, as arts workers has been historically um, undervalued, and yet 
we are the we are the the stewards of empathy and connection and so i feel like um it's very gratifying to hear all of that um i think we did we lose you uh todd no i see you you're there i'm pretty sure my neighbor's like downloading netflix right now so <laughs> i'm sure poor cox cable can only get so much through the tube right now <laughs> well i think that um I think that we we covered a lot of ground tonight, Todd, and and I am I am so grateful to you for your time. It doesn't appear that we have any questions, um, so I think unless you have anything else you'd like to share, um, you know, we can wrap this up. If I can just maybe conclude uh, with a certainly appreciation Please. to you, Kim, for facilitating, um, and to the rep for making this opportunity available. Uh, before, when we were backstage, before uh, and, and <laughs> allowed the participants to come in, I was sharing that I've basically sat here for six months and <laughs> I participated in a lot of candidate forums and debates. And I just feel like this is a wonderful way to kind of show a little bit about how I think and my priorities and whatnot. And so thank you for this opportunity. And I, then I would just say to the audience that's here, um, I'm gonna guess, go out on a limb and um, assume that you are some of the most intrepid patrons of the arts, right? You found your way uh, to this Zoom that you've sat here for not quite an hour. You two probably spent your entire day on Zoom and yet you signed up for another hour uh, with me. Um, it says to me maybe two things. One is that you are a huge supporter of the arts and of the rep. And I just wanna express my appreciation for that. Um, you know, our arts uh, in San Diego is largely philanthropic funded. Um, and so it's not possible without all of you. And to the extent that these difficult economic times that you're hanging in there, um, I just want to, I don't want to hear from me personally, how appreciative I am of that. Um, and then the other reason I think you're here is because like me, you care a lot about this city um, and that you would sit and listen to a politician talk for an hour on Zoom after you've been on Zoom all day. And maybe that's the common denominator tonight, right? Is that you care deeply about the city and you want the best for its future. And I hope what you've got this evening is a sense of who I am, how I think, and that I, we share that passion for this city and a desire to make it better. And uh, I can't, uh, I can't uh, sugarcoat it for you. The next couple of years are gonna be rough. They're gonna be very mm -hmm. difficult. But I have hope uh, that we can make this as brief as possible. Uh, that we can come out of it better and the end result the vision the the aspirational leadership piece of this should be that we embrace that we're the eighth largest city in the country and that by doing so uh, we don't become los angeles that's not what I, my goal <laughs> is um, but that we also don't define ourselves as not being la right we define ourselves as being a great american global world-class city um, and that we've tackled the issues that other cities have tackled things like vacation rentals and scooters that have been such a huge part of this race, but frankly are not the biggest issues facing our city. And that we actually tackle the ones that are big ones, which are homelessness, our infrastructure and our housing crisis. Um, and then that we aspire to something bigger and better. And again, um, a city can't be just a collection of buildings. Um, it has to be a city that is vibrant, that is alive, that has energy. And so much of that involves the arts. So um, we all care about the city. And I think we all care about the arts. And so I want to give you those parting thoughts is hopefully maybe some uh, some food during a time when we're all starving for some inspiration and some hope and some vision. Uh, and I hope that you agree with that vision. And I hope that all of you will be partners in helping to actually effectuate that. Uh, because I, at the end of the day, I am confident we'll defeat this pandemic. I'm confident we'll get the city back on its feet again. Um, and my goal is to make it, as my parents taught me, uh, to leave it better than I found it. And that will certainly be my goal if I'm your mayor. Thank you, Todd. Go get some lumpia. You deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Kim, thanks so much. And thank you. Everybody. All right. You take care. Likewise. Good luck to you. Bye. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you.